everyone. I welcome you in Jesus' name. I pray that tonight, whatever the Lord is revealing to us, will sink deep into every heart in Jesus' name. And the Lord will bless you and bless multitudes through you. You'll be fruitful. I will be fruitful. You'll be as I am. I said you'll be as I am. And the power of the Lord will keep on walking in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders, our fathers, our mothers, our workers, our members, ministers, everyone. We're asking, Lord, that tonight your word will penetrate every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, we will do good. Amen. The goodness of our lives and ministers will spread everywhere in Jesus' name. Amen. Establish us Amen. that we may establish your church. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're looking at uh, Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35, I'm reading from verse 1. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Abazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Meazer, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I sent before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, Tell me, drink your wine. This uh, chapter of um, Jeremiah comes as a surprise to many people. How can God tell Jeremiah, a prophet of God and a servant of God, a minister of the Lord, and tell him to go and give the house of the Rechamites wine to drink. But I thought, they said, you know, wine is wrong. And how can God go and tell somebody to go and do that? We need to understand something from the scriptures. Number one, there's a test. When God wants to prove somebody's character, somebody's conviction, somebody's consecration, somebody's faithfulness he brings a test but you need to understand what god calls test he wants to use that to prove their character and to prove that they're genuine people but satan will take that same thing in his own case it's not a test to prove that you can be faithful that you can have conviction and that you can stand. He, he uses that as a temptation. And that temptation is to draw away the person to compromise. Or draw him away to yielding or to falling or to sinning and losing his steadfastness. On the one hand, here is God and he's bringing an event and he's doing something and it is a test. But here is Satan, he takes that same event and he turns it to a temptation. Now here comes the person that is in the middle, is either yielding to God or yielding to Satan for him. It's a trial because of the painful pressure that comes upon him emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. And physically, because of that pressure, it's a trial. The same thing. Test on the side of God. Temptation on the side of Satan, on the side of the person. It's a trial. From God's perspective, just testing them. Wanting to know what's in their mind. 
from Satan's point of view, its temptation is going to use this and it's going to make them to trip. It's going to make this a snare for them. It's going to make this a trap for them and they're going to fall. That's what he thinks. But the believer, from his pressure point, this is a trial. It's a trial of faith. The test of faithfulness or eventually might be temptation to fall. Our conversion will be tested. Our conviction will be tested. Our consecration will be tested. Our covenant with God will be tested. Our conviction as well as our courage. You see, there's a connection between the conviction and the courage. A person may say, I'm courageous. And I say, what are you standing for? What are you contending for? It says, I'm courageous. There's no battle. There's no contention. There's no challenge. There's no courage there. It is when you have a conviction. And that conviction can be tested. And then you can stand in the face of what Satan may want to turn that to. That's what we call courage. And your courage is going to be tested. Our conscience will be tested. Now I'm born again. Now I'm a child of God. And I have a conscience clear of a face for God, between God and me and between man and myself. That conscience will be tested. And your character will be put to the test. Now... The Lord actually knew the Rechabites. He knew they were going to stand like you're going to stand when it comes to your turn. Yeah. Like I'm going to stand when it comes to my turn. Yeah. That whatever the fire and whatever the pressure, here comes the test and then the Rechabites, God knew they were going to stand. Satan, of course, will not know. When the test comes, it says, this is my chance. I'm going to use this to make him fall, to make him sin, to make him compromise, to make him lose his confidence and courage in God, and to make him fall so that he will lose his steadfastness and he will lose his ticket to heaven. That's what Satan thinks. But thank God, somebody there can stand. Yeah. Thank God, somebody there will stand. Yeah. But now, why is God doing this? You look at chapter 35 of Jeremiah, and you're wondering, how could God do that? You see, in this chapter, he was going to use a faithful family as an object lesson. You know, when we're teaching uh, children, young people, and we say half plus half, equals one you know little children don't understand that so what we do we take a sheet of paper and we cut into two we say this is one out of two one out of two means one over two and this two is one out of two one over two and then we bring them together this is half and this is half children what is this and they say one so i say half plus half equals one. And then I divide this half into two equal parts and this half into two equal parts. One, two, three, four. And I pick one out. And I say, what is this? They say, this is one out of four. One over four. I write that for them. I count one, two, three. This is three out of four. Three quarters, three over four. If I bring everything together, young people, what is this? One over four plus three over four. Class, tell me. One. And so, that's an object lesson. We are taking a practical object. And that practical object, we're using it to teach the people we're teaching. That's exactly what God is doing here. But why? The Lord had taught them over and over and over by speaking to them. And they couldn't hear. They didn't understand. They didn't respond. That's why I took this object lesson. Let me show you the condition of these people we're talking about. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. 
Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk ye and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, what did they say? We will not walk therein. And then verse 17 also, I set watchmen over you, saying, Hacking to the voice of the trumpet. But they said, what did they say? We will not hacking. They are spoken to them. And because they had spoken to them, they didn't understand. They were thinking, a whole nation, they were disobedient. And so he picked a family and he said, you whole nation, I'm your father, I'm your God, I'm your creator. I'm speaking to you, you are not hearing. I'm going to pick this family and I'm going to show you it's not so difficult to be obedient. They're obedient. It's not so difficult to be faithful. They're faithful. And it only takes you know, a decision like them. One family here, one family here, one family here. And you all obey each one of you. And then there's going to be an obedient nation. Look at chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 27. Chapter 7, verse 27. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them. But they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer. Verse 28, but thou shalt say unto them, This is the nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. That was the condition. It was a repeated kind of a character that they had. And God wanted to use this family. We're reading about in chapter 35 to drive up the point home. Chapter 11 verse 8. In chapter 11 verse 8, yet they obeyed not, yet he's still speaking to them, yet he sent prophets, yet is one them yet is threatening them that the Babylonians are going to come and sweep them all away. Yet he blessed them and he multiplied the fruits of their land. Yet that means that whatever God had done and whatever God had given and whatever God had withdrawn, yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear. But they walked every man in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do. But, tell me, they did them not. That was the problem. And because of that prevailing problem in their midst, that's why God said, okay, I'm going to use the family to show you that what... This family is doing us exactly what I'm asking from you. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. Look at chapter 14, verse 10. Chapter 14, verse 10. Thus says the Lord unto these people. Thus are they lodged to wonder. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Chapter 29, reading from verse 19. In chapter 29, reading from verse 19. Because they have not hearkened to my word, says the Lord. Uh, can you see from chapter to chapter to chapter the condition of the children of Israel, of the, of the people of Judah and Jerusalem? It says, because they have not hearkened to my word, says the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but they would not hear, says the Lord. It was a real challenge in the midst of those people. We we'll come to chapter 44, and I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 44, verse 16. 
It says in chapter 44, verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, what follows? We will not hearken unto thee. We're coming from chapter 1 to chapter 6. Now we're in chapter 44. And the people were still adamant. And in it was the word of the Lord. And he mentioned and proclaimed it was the word of the Lord. He said, as for the word that you have spoken unto us, in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly, sure, assuredly do whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our mouth. That's the reason why, since the Lord has used all these uh, prophets to speak to them, and was expecting them, they'll be repentant. He was expecting them, they will yield to him. He was expecting them that they will see all the good things he has done for them, and all the good things he meant to them, and that goodness of the Lord will lead them to repentance. But no, it did not. That's the reason why he now said, Jeremiah, there's something else we can do. We can take an object lesson now. They don't understand theory. They don't understand instruction coming from the pulpit. So let's take an object lesson. Let's take a practical scene and then I'm sending you somewhere. Why is that, Lord? I'm sending you to the house of the Rechabites. And when you get there, you'll give them wine to drink. And isn't it, some, isn't it something wonderful that Jeremiah, he knew that this, how can that be? How can I go to them and tell them the kind of prophet I am? I believe in holiness. I believe in righteousness. I believe in the word of God. And God is sending me to do something like this. But he is God is God. And so, whatever he has in mind, I'm going to obey. I pray you'll be like Jeremiah. Yeah. You'll obey the Lord in Jesus' name. Yeah. And you see this story we're reading, I come to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15, we're looking at verse 4. It says, for whatsoever things were reaching aforetime, they were reaching for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It's saying that what we are going to read today, what we are going to study today, this story you find in Jeremiah chapter 35, is written for our learning. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's bringing us to this so that we'll understand that this is an object lesson for you and for me. And when the test comes to you, you will pass your test. I'm coming to Jeremiah chapter 35. We're looking at the old chapter actually. We're dividing the chapter to three parts. Number one, the test of consecration to the heavenly father. The test of consecration to the heavenly father. Point number two, the testimony of conviction in their harmonious family. The Rechabites, it's not just the men over there that kept faithful and that kept true. Every one of them, the husband, the wife, the sons, the daughters, the whole family, harmonious together, united together, in agreement together, with one consent and one accord. They were obedient to the word of the Lord. And the Lord was saying, you see that family? Harmonious, agreeable, agreeing together, of one mind, of one focus, of one direction, and they're obedient unto me, unto their father. Why can't the people of Judah be obedient unto me? Point number two, the testimony of conviction in their harmonious families. Family. Number three, the triumph of constancy with humble faithfulness. The triumph of constancy. You know, when somebody is converted 
and consistently everything he hears from the word of God, he walks according to the word consistently, constantly, without turning here or turning there, without yielding to temptation, without going into the world, just straight paths and a narrow path that leads to glory. And it just was consistently and constantly uncompromising, unwavering, and is committed to the word of God. The, rage, the, the sea may rage and the lions may roar and the difficulties may be there and there may be pebbles or stone in front of him and the mountain may be steep and the valley may be dangerously, you know, slopey. All the same, every time in every season, constancy, constancy, consistency is walking and walking and walking according to the will of the Lord. That's triumph. That's triumph. That's victory. It, it, point number three, the inner, the triumph of constancy with humble faithfulness. Number one. What's your number one there? The test of consecration to the heavenly father. We'll come back to Jeremiah chapter 35. And I'm reading here now. We've read verses 1 to 5 already. Let me just repeat verse 5. In verse 5, and I search before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pots full of wine and cups. And I search unto them, drink ye wine. The Rechabites were not told that. They were being tested. Please understand that. You know, when tests come to us, the test, there's no announcement. Testing, testing, testing. No. You know, one way, as we, you know, we've been to school, when you were going to school, the teachers and teachers and teachers, and then they tell us the date of the exam, the date of testing. God does not announce. That is going to be the date of testing. And as you look at your Bible, God didn't tell Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to tell you something tomorrow, but don't you worry about it. It's a test. No. And God didn't tell Gideon, you know, Gideon, I'm going to get all those people together. And I'm going to do something. Don't worry about this. This is just a test. Testing, testing, test. Not at all. And as we look at Hezekiah, we're ready about Hezekiah. You're going to see what we're going to read now. That Hezekiah, he had a test. He had a trial. But the Lord didn't tell Hezekiah, I'm, I'm sending some Babylonians to you. And don't worry about this. This is just a test. Can I do the review with you? That when those people come, they will say this this and this is what you must say no the test was not announced and that's why many people fail the christian test the test of righteousness and the test of faithfulness and the test of conviction and the test of consecration because there is no announcement ahead of time that alerts us that a test is coming I pray that from this time, you'll be on the lookout. And when your tests come, you will pass the test. I will pass my test. I said, I will pass my test. You'll pass your test in Jesus' name. Many people fail the test of constancy without even knowing that testing times have come and gone. We test the metal. You want to use the metal to carry some weight. You test that metal to prove its worth. Let's come to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 12. James chapter 1. Reading from verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, you see that, he calls it temptation, he calls it trial. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Look at verse 13, very important. Let no man say, when he is tempted, when he is tried, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. The meaning of that is he does not test us to fall. He does not test us so that he has decided, I want, I want him to go to hell. I want him to perish. I want him to fall. So I'm going to put a stumbling block 
in front of him. You know, it's a Satan that does that. That he knows you are running a race. He knows you are going somewhere. And then not to, to make you not run well. And not run uh, confidently. He puts a stumbling block in front of you. God will never do that. Only Satan does that. And of course, those who are listening to Satan, those are the people that will do it to their friend, or they do it to their neighbor, or they do it to a believer, or they do it to a minister to make him fall. God will never do that. He brings tests, but the test is to prove your worth. The test is to prove that you can make it. But Satan brings it and other things. Look at verse 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err. Do not make a mistake. Do not go astray. My beloved brethren, we're coming to First Peter chapter 1. There are tests, there are trials, but on the side of God, just proving your worth, proving how strong you are, how consistent you are, how faithful you are, how steadfast you are. But Satan will use that same sin and turn it to a temptation to make you fall. I see people there that will not fall. Amen. You'll not fall in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. That the trial of your faith, trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom have you not seen ye love? But that love will be tested. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, that faith believing will be tested. He rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the outcome of your faith, the result of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 17. By faith, Abraham when he was tried by faith Abraham when he was what's the word there tried offered up Isaac and he that received the promise offered up his only begotten son I want you to underline that word there it says by faith Abraham when he was tell me out aloud Good class, tell me the word. Yeah. Tried. But I want you to come to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. You always have to balance up all these things so you understand that this is a test. Tried him to know whether he was stand, whether he will be steadfast, whether he will still love God above this gift of a son he's been waiting for for so many years look at uh, genesis chapter 22 genesis chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 1 and it came to pass after these things that god did what's the next word tempt abraham you see when people read that they say but you said god does not tempt anyone you see is the english translation and the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, tells us very clearly, it is not a temptation to make him fall. It's a trial, a test to make him show the worth of his love and covenant with God. It says, and it came to pass, after these six, that God did try Abraham, test Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, 
and he said behold here I am and he said take now thy son thine only son Isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering unto one, in one of the uh, mountains uh, which I will tell thee of and Abraham what did he do rose up early in the morning he had passed the test already because you see uh, he loved that son Ishmael was no more there and this is the only son and God said take that son and God said whom you love and go and sacrifice him to me as a burnt offering in the mountain I will show you he didn't say Lord but why but how about this? And God didn't say, Abraham, testing, testing, testing. Don't worry about this. I'm just testing you. If you say yes, that's okay. If you say no, that's not all right. So you know what you are going to say. I'm going to demand something of you. And I know what I'm going to do. I know something will show up at the end of the line. No. He didn't know anything will show up at the end of the line. And yet he passed the test. How I pray for you, you will pass the test. We're coming to, we're coming to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. And I'm going to read here from verse 2. Judges chapter 7. We're looking at it from verse 2. It is a test. Many things come to us in life. Many things come to us in the church. Many things come to us in the ministry. That is just to test us. But the Lord is not going to announce, I'm testing you. And if you give the right answer, if you give the right response, that means you're going to go to the next level. Amen. I'm talking about somebody going to go to the next level there. You'll get there in Jesus' name. I'm looking at this in Judges chapter 7 verse 2. Judges chapter 7 verse 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites sin to their hands. Let Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my, my own hand has set me now. Therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And uh, their return of the people, how many? 20 and 2,000, and their remainder 10,000. You see that? You know, sometimes uh, a preacher, a pastor, a shepherd, a teacher, a leader may come and then he gives a message. And the message is strange. It's like he it throws a kind of a steel ball right on your forehead and you, you know you, you manage you you know escape it and then you say i don't think i'm coming next time because it looks like you know this is hard this is tough it's just a test to know whether you are a son or you are a daughter whether you are there whatever comes and whatever goes whether you are there or whether whatever is being said is going to jolt you it's going to destabilize you. It's going to test your conviction. It's going to test your consecration. It's going to test your covenant with the Lord. And then you say, yes, I made a covenant with the Lord, but I didn't mean to go that far. There you are. You see here Gideon, he was told, tell them, whoever is afraid, let him go back. And it says, 22,000 went back. Look at uh, verse 4 here. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many to bring them down. So bring them down onto the water. And I will try. What's the word there? Yeah. I will. What's the word there? Yeah. Try. You see, God tests people. He tries people. He wants to know what's in their heart. He wants to know what's their commitment. He wants to know what's their consecration. He wants to know what they will do when that critical situation comes. It's easy to say, I'm saved. I'm saved too. I'm born again. Many others are born again too. I'm committed to the Lord. Many others are committed to the Lord too. I'm covenanted with the Lord. I'm going to be a worker. I'm going to die at my post. Anybody can say that. But there's a test. 
there's a trial there's something that comes to you to shake you and everything shakeable in your life will be sifted out because God tries people look at that verse 4 again and the Lord said unto Gideon the, uh, it says bring them the people are yet too many bring them down onto the water and I will try them for thee there and it shall be that uh, whom of whom I say unto thee this shall go with thee the same shall go with thee and of whom I shall say uh, this shall not go with thee uh, the, the same shall not go look at verse uh, 5 it says so he brought them he brought down the people unto the water and the Lord said unto Gideon everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as the dog lappeth him shall thou search by himself and likewise everyone that bowest down upon his knees to drink and the number of them that lapped putting their hand to their mouth were 300 men but all the rest 9,700 9, all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water and the Lord said unto Gideon by the 300 by the 300 men that laughed will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Ah, what did I do now? Why did you disqualify me? What's the big deal in that? You brought us to the water, and we saw the water. There's no cup, and there's nothing we were going to use to drink. So what could we have done? And we were very thirsty. How about the other 300? The other 300, their might was on the battlefield. Their eyes were on the battlefield. Their focus was on the battlefield. They were looking like this, and then they were taking the water with their hand, and they were lapping like a dog. And nobody taught them to do that. It's a condition of their mind. It's a commitment of their soul. It's their consecration unto the Lord. And the Lord said, Gideon, you know what? These 300 people that their mind, their heart, their focus, their consecration, everything is on the battlefield. Those are the people that will go with you. All the other people, you're talking about, you know, pleasures of the world. You're talking about, this is my chance. When are we going to get water again to drink? I got this one. I'm going to take this one to the full. They were disqualified. I pray you will not be disqualified. We're looking at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32, and I'm reading from verse 24. Second Chronicles chapter 32, and here we're reading from verse 24. The test that came to this great king. In a Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 24, it says in verse 24, in those days, Ezekiah, you remember him? Uh, what do you remember about him? How many years do you remember about him? Fifty years added to him. That's the man that said, I refuse to die. A man of great faith. That's the man that said, I said, what am I hearing? No, I will not die. I will not die. Somebody shout, I will not die. And then God said, I, I said, go and tell him. I've given him 15 extra years. You know, that, that's what we know about the man. Look at this, Numbers 24, Second Chronicles chapter 32. In those days, Hezekiah was sick to death, and he prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Ah, his heart was lifted up. You know, after somebody has prayed and a great miracle happened. After somebody has been given that negative prophecy and he says, I reject that, I'm not going to die. And he feels on top. And this has never happened to any other king before this one. I got this by the strength of my faith. His heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem, notwithstanding. 
Hezekiah humbled not himself for the pride of his heart, but he and the inhabitants of Judah, so that wrath, the wrath of the Lord came upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Verse 31 now. Verse 31. Verse 31. Are you there? If you are there, tell me what you see there. Yeah, there. You're always there. You'll always be there. Amen. Verse 31. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to try him. Okay, answer by yourself. Tell them what you want to tell them. Show them what you are going to show them. God left him. He wouldn't influence him. He wouldn't force him. Okay, you can do whatever you want to do. What liberty? And sometimes we don't know that that liberty is a test. That opportunity is a test. Go wherever you want. Today is a free day. There's no meeting today. And there's nobody calling you to do anything today. Whatever you want to do, you're free. Whoever comes to you, you're free. Whatever comes to your mind, you're free. It's a test. Look at this again. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. You know, the remains of the property there that he might know all that is in his heart. And the remains, uh, the remainder of, uh, you know, the pleasure of the world and loving the world more than loving God, that he might know what was chill in the heart. That's why the psalmist said, look at Psalm 139, Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, I'm reading here from verse 23 and verse 24. Psalm 139, reading from verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. The Lord will lead you. Amen. His eyes will guide you. It will not leave you to yourself. Amen. You will not fall. Amen. The test will come. You will pass your test. Amen. Daniel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 10. Daniel chapter 12 verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Many, many shall be purified. They'll be made white. They'll be tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. The wise shall understand. You will understand. We're coming back to Jeremiah chapter 35. And I'm reading now from verse 6. This is the second point now. The testimony of conviction in their harmonious family. Remember once again the test that came to them. No announcement. Testing, testing, testing. But they made it. If they could make it, looks like I can make it too. I said I can make it too. In the grace of God. By the strength of the Lord. Amen. By the revelation of the Spirit. Amen. You'll make it. Amen. Look at chapter 35. I'm reading from verse 6. But they said, We will drink no wine. For Jonadab the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall drink no wine, neither ye. Now your sons, how long? Forever. Forever. See, there are people that take a consecration as a temporary thing. Okay, because of uh, the challenge we have now, and we are for this drive of evangelism, 
gospel explosion movement because of that gem and because of the special sunday service so we can have spiritual supernatural dominion we're reaching out our consecration is for now and we're going to have the retreat and this retreat is of his kingdom and we're driving and we're pushing and we're drawing people of course we are consecrated but after the special sunday service and after the retreat now we can relax consecration is over no not at all you see this the recommendations understood that what their father commanded them was not only for the lifetime of the father the father now was gone the father was no more there but now they said jeremiah was all due respect we will not drink wine because our father commanded us and he said drink no wine neither you nor your sons forever look at verse 7 neither shall ye build house that's tall no so seed watch no plant vineyard no have any even if they give you as a gift they say okay we're not telling you to plant it yourself we're planted i was just giving you this as a gift even to have any but all your days you shall dwell in tents that she may live many days in the land where ye be strangers thus have we what's the next word there obeyed the voice of jonadab the son of Rechab, our father in all that he charged us in all in all that he charged us we were not following by selective obedience okay i pick this that one i agree i give accent to this that one i agree this one who will do this one in this modern life this one who will yield to this one in this a new age that we're now this one who's going to give in to that in this internet uh, dispensation it does old old style that one is old old fashion how can you give yourself to this now it's in the bible and so what we're talking about modern time but you know the Rechabites, they were not they didn't think that you know that the commandments of god expired that the commandment instruction of their father expired that because of the age you are living now we don't have to be obedient to everything in total in details anymore look at this they say thus have we obeyed the voice of jonadab the son of Rechab, our father in all that he charged us to drink no wine all our days they didn't count it as you know something heavy what a terrible father we have and what a kind of a hard father we have or the kind of old time father we have or the kind of straight jacket father we have narrow-minded father we have did he cheerfully this is our father this is what he gave us and this is the commandment he gave us and delightfully we are going to keep on all our days and then he said we our wives our sons and our daughters you see at the time their father told them we were not married but now as we are getting married they were telling their wives this is the commandment of our father oh the wife said that's strange but well if you are going to marry me that's it that's where i stand that's what i have how long are we going to do that five years for the rest of our lives how about when we have children and the sons and the daughters they come the same doctrine the same way of life and the same holiness without which no man shall see the lord is the same thing you see these people they were not picking and choosing and they were not making the obedience to the word of god to the word of their father instruction of their father to be something temporary it was forever salvation is forever I said salvation is forever. Yes. Repentance is forever. Yes. And restitution is forever. Yes. 
Righteousness is forever. Amen. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord is forever. The family, godly family, the man being the head of the home, that's forever. And the wife in submission to the husband, that's forever. And the members of the church obedient to the minister in the church, that's forever. What are we talking about? That the standard of the word had been given to us. And then somebody wants to say, well, that was in the 70s. I don't understand in the 70s. We're reading the same Bible. The same Bible of the 70s. The same Bible of the 80s. And the same Bible of the 90s. And the same Bible in the 21st century. And these people understood that the word that their father taught them was still the same. And by the grace of God, the Palai Bible Church was still going to keep on standing. Yeah. Standing on the same word he has taught us until the end of our lives in Jesus' name. Yeah. And then he goes and look at verse 11. And but it came to pass that when Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon came up into the land that we said come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians so were dwelt at Jerusalem. But dwelling at Jerusalem doesn't make any difference. We're dwelling here in Lagos. We're going there. We're going to Portacot. We're going to a uh, place now, Mina in Niger. We're now living in, you know, Sokoto. Wherever we're living, the word of God is still the word of God. And the same deeper life is still the same deeper life. And we're going to keep the same standard in Jesus' name. Now, when the word of God came to us many years ago, you know, I, your teacher, your teacher, I wasn't married. And later I got married, but the word of God remains the word of God. I didn't have any children. The word of God was the word of God. Then I had children. The word of God is still the word of God. And you were not married. Maybe when you got the word the first time, the word of God still remains. And now you are married. And your children are getting married. The word of God, even as your children are getting married, and you're having grandchildren now, the word of God remains the word of God. Give me a good day. Amen. Amen. And we're not going to bend and shift and change because now you know we are family people now. Evangelism, well, I still have that, that thirst and that passion compel them to come in. And the same thing with you and with everyone. Everything we were taught before, everything stands according to the word of God in Jesus' name. Because here is what the Lord wanted. And he was doing this, remember, to prove them, to prove them. And it's true to the test. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 2. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee to prove thee. You see that? To prove thee. To know what was what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no it is to prove us and then he tells us in verse 16 look at verse 16 there it says who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do and uh, to do thee good at thy latter end. He says he's uh, getting this to you and he's proving you and he's testing you so that you, he will do you good at the latter end. Greater goodness is coming to you. Yeah. Look at chapter 13. Determine chapter 13 verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and a sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods let's change let's modify let's have another god let's have a lower standard Let's worship something that's not so demanding. Let's go after other gods which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God, what's he doing? Prophets you, prophets you to know 
whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 4, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. That's what you will do. Look at verse 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly. Look at this. These are the closest people to you. These are the people you love and the people that love you. These are the people that it's difficult to say no to them. But it says you love God above every person on the face of the earth. And it, it spells them out. And I pray that the conviction and the commitment and the courage to say no, when you ought to say no, the Lord will give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You remember? You remember? You remember? Wherever you go and whatever you do, do not say yes when you ought to say no. Do you remember that? Yes. You sang that yes. in the primary school. It's still obtaining today. Wherever you go and whatever you do, do not say yes when you ought to say no. And it's giving us a platform for standing uncompromisingly on the word of God. Even in the primary school, because we are not born again, we need to understand what it meant. But this is what it meant. Look at verse 6 again. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly. And it says, a sinner, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nice unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him. Any amen there? Yeah. Nor hearken unto him. Yeah. Neither shall thine eye pity. Neither shall thou spare. Neither shall thou conceal him. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 21. Proverbs Chapter 24, verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King. Fear thou the Lord and the King. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. There are people, you know, they are always changing like chameleons. They believe this today. They believe another thing the following year. Here they are standing on conviction today. Another two, three years, they are not standing again. And those are the people who are given to change. And the Lord said, do not meddle with them. Do not cooperate with them. Do not uh, kind of... Uh, you know, I agree with them. We're looking at Psalm 15. In Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? It goes on, verse 4 now. You know, says a vile person is contempt, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. Can we read that together? He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. What does that mean? It means that you know you go to the Lord, you commit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll not touch that, I'll not go there, I'll not wear that, I'll not drink that, I'll not mix up with that. Now you're out of school. 
and you are looking for work and work is curse and you get to a particular place they test you and they look at everything they say young man you're the most brilliant person we ever interviewed the job is available for you but you know over here there are some conditions because of the economy of the country we cut edges and we do it this way, we do it this way, we do it this way. And when our customers come, sometimes, sometimes not every time, some big customers will bribe them. And sometimes some people come and uh, they want to buy something, but they want us to put a little bit more, like 20%. And we're talking about billions. And we'll make much money here and we'll pay you well. But you have to agree to this. And before you got your certificate, you had made a covenant with the Lord. Lord, I'm going to serve you. In riches, in poverty, in hunger, in satisfaction, whatever comes, whatever goes, I'm going to serve you. And I'm going to be faithful, transparently honest. And now look at this job. They say the condition is that you will cut corners. You say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. Well, the job is there. I want to give it to you. You are handling yourself. By the way, why don't you want to do this? I'm a Christian. Ah, ah, you think we are pagans? I'm a Christian too. I go to, can I tell you my church? I go to that church and I go to that place. How about you? Where do you go? You say, it's not important. It's not where I go to church. Even if I didn't go to that church, here is my covenant with the Lord. Here is where I stand. This is okay. You want to go hungry? There's no other company you are going to get at this time that will not tell you this. So what we are telling you, if you go to another place, we know you are good, you are sharp upstairs. But they're going to tell you the same thing. And if you don't bend, you'll go hungry. You'll be jobless, unemployed. He swears to his own heart. And he changes not. You see, life is not going to be all rosy because you are consecrated. The Lord will test your consecration. And I pray you will pass your test. Amen. I said you will pass your test. Amen. Look at that verse 4 again. He that swear to his own hurt and changes not, you will not change. Amen. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 119 verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Times are tough. Let me not wander away. Verse 21. In verse 21, thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Uh, 118. Uh, that is verse 1. 1 8. It says, Thou was trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is a falsehood. And then it tells us in verse 141, I am small and despised, yet do I not forget thy precepts. Let's remind ourselves again of these Rechabites. The Rechabites were tried and proved faithful. You will be faithful. Amen. The long period of holding the fort did not weaken them. The careless disobedience of those around them did not hinder them. The death and the departure of their father, who told them, who gave them that commandment, did not shift their position. The new family members, their sons and their daughters that now are added to the family, did not change their conviction. 
the stature and the prestige of Jeremiah, the prophet that came to test them, did not intimidate them. The peculiarity of their conviction. No other person keeps this kind of conviction. All the other people, they are at large and they are free and they are, you know, enjoying pleasure. The peculiarity of their conviction did not uh, make them feel ashamed. And the uncertainty of the times did not diminish their conviction. And I pray that whatever may be happening around us, we're going to stand even till the end of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. God commended the family, but he condemned the whole nation. Let's come to point number three now. The triumph and constancy, the triumph of constancy with humble faithfulness. We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35, and I'm reading from verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 35, we're reading from verse 8. Are you there now? You got there before me. Look at verse 8. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab. Thus have we, what's the word? Obeyed. Obeyed. You know, there's no shortcut. Obeyed. You know, sometimes it grinds a little, but we have obeyed. It looks unpopular, but we have obeyed. It looks like it's not politically correct not politically accepted and if you're going to mix with the powers that be they know you and they feel that you know you should get near why are you so far away by the way how are you getting contracts you don't have friends that are you know politicians that are senators that are in the house of reps are you making it now come on come near and you can get something but you know if you get near so near it's going to their kind of life is going to rub on you and you will not be standing straight like you were standing before because of money because of contract and it's going to be difficult to obey if you're able to you know get near them and still keep your stand and you're standing firm and erect without bending praise the lord i don't know how many people are doing that look at verse 8 those that we obey the voice of jonadab the son of Rechab our father in all that he has charged us in all in all that he has charged us and then he goes on to say to drink no wine all our days we and our wives we and our wives you know sometimes it's at the even at the time of the wedding you can see that the man is not the head of the home at the time they are wedding and then they are going for reception, you can see that the lady is the one dictating everything. And uh, you know, we are going to do this, we are going to do it this way. Hey, we are getting married. I am the head of the home and the man. I didn't put myself there, but God made me the head of the home. No, we are not going to do it like that. And the lady begins to cry. And because of the tears, you are going to disgrace me at in our reception. And at this time, when all my friends are coming, my you know, colleagues are coming, so and so did his own marriage, and so and so did her own marriage, and now it is now my turn, and I'm saying that we'll do this and carry this and carry this. What are you carrying? What matters is heaven. And what matters is pleasing the Lord. And then the lady begins to cry. And because you cannot bear the tears of your wife, therefore you say, okay, okay, don't cry anymore. I feel sorrowful that I've hurt you. <laughs> you, you don't have any backboard. I pity you. And that woman knows that everything she shed, every time she shed tears, she's going to catch you. She's going to be the head of the home. But you take your stand. I'm talking to men. Yeah. I said you take your stand. Yeah. And if the woman wants to love God, if he loves you because you love God, if he loves you because you're a Christian, if he loves you because you're a deep and live member, and you want to stand and remain deep and live, she will shape up. And she will line up. But you know, for us to just uh, module everything together, we don't know who is ahead. We don't know who is to submit. We don't know what direction we're going. It will not be. 
uh, look at this it says that we have obeyed we our wives our sons and our daughters and then it goes on to say look at verse 18 uh, what the lord is saying now for them uh, let me let me back up for to verse 14 the words of jonadab the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine are performed that's the almighty god talking and now look at the reward of that the triumph that came as a result of that jeremiah chapter 35 verse 18 and jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, thus says the lord of hosts the god of israel because that ye have what's the word that's the word. That's the word. The word of God is there. The standard of the word of God is there. The conviction is there. And God is saying, because you have obeyed. You have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab shall not lack, that's what it means there, shall not one, shall not lack a man to stand before me, tell me, forever. That's because of obedience forever. The blessing was forever. Your blessing will be forever. Amen. Can I hear the sister say, Amen? Amen. Our blessings will be forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter. 22 genesis chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 15 and the angel of the lord called unto abraham out of heaven the second time and said by myself have i sworn says the lord for because thou hast done this sin and hast not withheld thy son thine only son that in blessing i will bless thee in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Yeah. But look at this, verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the earth be blessed because 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 that's a bitch my voice it's your turn you'll obey the lord what are you there rise up and tell the lord the test will come the trial will come but you make up your mind i'm going to be obedient to the word of the lord the word of god is not changing the standard is not changing the doctrine is not changing and the firm stand we used to have is what we still have why don't you call upon the lord and say lord strengthen me my backbone strengthen me my very heart strengthen me i want to stand i want to be faithful and the lord will help you the test comes the trial comes I pray you'll pass your test.